What's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to NanoCast, a brand new podcast all about the crypto nano. Nano is fast, feeless, scalable, and led by a driven team. It has inspired thousands of people to to participate in the development of its apps and services. And on this podcast, you'll get to meet some of those people and learn what they're up to. Before we get started, I just want to remind you that this episode, just like the rest, are sponsored by NanoThings. So if you leave a comment and subscribe, you'll be entered to win a sticker. And who doesn't want a sticker? So today we've got Daniel Brain from BrainBlocks. Daniel, thanks so much for being with us. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself, where you're from, what you do during the day, and uh, how you got into Nano. Uh, yeah, hi. So it's really, really good to be on the podcast. Um, so I'm an I'm an engineer based in uh, based in San Jose in California. Um, I guess I've been here about three or four years now. Um, I've been an engineer for maybe seven or eight. Um, currently working for PayPal. Um, so doing all things checkout and payments and um, open source and so on. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess I guess I kind of became part of this crypto community uh, maybe three or four months ago. Uh, came across this na- nano currency and just thought I'd uh, you know dive in and, and see what it's all about. And so far, I've been really really impressed. So so glad to be here talking about mm-hmm. it today. So what brought you to Nano three or four months ago? Why Nano or Rayblox at the time? Uh, so I guess um, I guess I've been following cryptocurrencies for a while. You know. Put a put a little money in a few, invested in a few. Kind of, I've been tracking how how they've been doing, and I, I guess originally a few years ago when I first encountered things like Bitcoin, I was really excited to see what what could be made of them as an actual currency. Mm. Um, having having an investment vehicle is great, um, but obviously, you know, if anything is going to happen in this area, it's going to be actually using these coins for some real purpose, mm. actually making them into something you can use to pay or um, send money between friends or really do something useful uh, rather than just put your money in and see how much it grows because obviously that's not going to be too sustainable. Mm-hmm. Um, so so I started tracking Bitcoin. I started seeing all of the kind of forks that, that spawned out of it um, that more and more people are saying, okay, I, I can I can go put my money in an altcoin instead. And and really it just seems like more, more of the same of that to me. Um, and then just before uh, the, the new year, um, I read about this Rayblox currency, which I guess is now Nano, um, and I kind of saw something which I hadn't seen before. It seems to be something that is really geared towards functioning as an actual currency. Uh, you know, the, just the fact that it's it's free, doesn't have any transaction fees, the fact that it's so fast, yeah. which is something that seems to be relatively rare in the cryptocurrency mm-hmm. world. Um, and you know the attitude of the, the core developers just just led me to think, okay, this, this has to be there has to be something good going on here. Um, and actually seeing that is what kind of encouraged me to to start actually hacking away on it and building mm-hmm. stuff around it. That that really encouraged me, and that you know, and I, I still think this thing has so much potential. Mm-hmm. So when you started uh, hacking away at it, as you say, um, like how many days had it been since you had heard about Rayblox? Um, so I guess I guess I probably heard about it around November December time mm-hmm. um, in 2017. Back back when there was the whole you know boom around cryptocurrencies, a lot of people were pouring their money into altcoins and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, so I read about it then. Um, at the time, I was back in the UK on vacation, just visiting some family for Christmas, and I didn't really have a lot of time to do anything. Um, and then pretty much the moment I got back here, um, back to San Jose, I sat on my on my laptop and I thought, okay, well. Let's let's take a look at what this thing has to offer. Let's take a look at the the RPC protocol that it offers, and and you know maybe I'll just see see if I can get something working. I'll just send a simple amount to and from um, an account, and that turned out to be super easy to do. Um, it turned out to be really really easy to set up this, the whole uh, node on my system and get a little server running. Mm-hmm. So so I ended up spending a few more days and building something out, and I thought, okay, well this is this is cool. I can I actually have something I can release here that might be useful for the community. So mm-hmm. um, so I did, and I pasted it up there, and um, yeah, I got a huge response. Yeah, which was fantastic. When you uh, threw it up on you know on Reddit and I assume you Discord, did you expect to get the response that you got? Um, honestly, no. So uh, you know this this was literally just a, a weekend project, maybe three or four days at most. Mm. Um, not very much polish. Uh, hadn't done anything to make it scale, and I just posted it on on Reddit to begin with. Um, I wasn't even aware of the Discord server at the time, okay. so I posted it on Reddit, just saying, "Okay, uh, here's something that I've hacked together. You know, does anyone have any feedback? Is this useful for anyone? Is this something that that people could need?" Um, and the the response that I got was, I mean, I did that. I waited a couple of hours. I went to bed, and I got 
I started getting beeps at maybe 4 a.m. saying my server's gone down. Um, you know, thousands upon thousands of people are visiting this this article and trying to use what I'd built. And I was just totally floored by, awesome. by that reaction. It seemed like, you know, it seemed, it seemed like everyone wanted to start using this thing. And I was like, oh, God, OK. Yeah. <laughs> I just I just wanted a few, you know, a few comments saying, hey, mm-hmm. can we have this feature or that feature? And uh, yeah, I, I got my entire server taken down. So I spent... I spent an hour or so trying to trying to get up with a dedicated server mm-hmm. and get a bit more capacity there, and uh, yeah, managed to get a bit more sleep that night. That, um, but I was totally overwhelmed with all of the all the responses. That's really there. cool. Did your previous experience at PayPal is that what equipped you to be able to do what you did for Rayblocks? So I think starting starting with PayPal has kind of given me a lot of interest in what what really is the future of of payments. So I mean, one of our mission statements in, in my team is to figure out really what what is the easiest way people can pay. What's what are the least interactions people can do on a website or on their mobile devices in order to to pay uh, to pay someone and receive a product mm-hmm. or to receive a, a digital product or something like that. So that's that's kind of been at the forefront of my mind mm-hmm. for the last few few years, um, and I think. Um, we've definitely been able to make a lot of headway there at PayPal, but the, the whole crypto space opens up a world of possibilities for, for that. Um, I, I guess right now, when you make a payment with a cryptocurrency, typically it's a very uh, convoluted process. You see a QR code, you have to take a photo, you have to have a, a wallet set up, and it's a lot of kind of juggling of devices and a lot of steps. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's like that's one of the, the areas that I see that there could be a lot of improvement, and you know, a lot of my learnings from PayPal could be could be relevant. Mm. How can we how can we make this thing much more of a seamless, you know, a seamless process for buyers so that they're kind of more incentivized to actually use cryptocurrencies rather than just their credit card? Right. Um, so I think there's a lot of there's a lot of room for that there in, in Nano, mm-hmm. uh, and that's that's something that I definitely want to explore as part of Brain Sure. Um, but just generally generally speaking, yeah, I think. Um, I, I think, well, a lot of the things we've been doing at PayPal, at least in terms of open source projects, um, we've been able to leverage for, for BrainBlocks mm-hmm. too. Actually, a few of the things that I've released uh, from PayPal in the open source world we're using as part of the BrainBlocks product. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's pretty cool too. Yeah. Um, I worked uh, at Apple and just the retail store. And uh, when I did that, I had to I had to sign a, a paper that said that anything that I created belonged to Apple. <laughs> um did you have to sign anything like that for PayPal, or how does that work here? Um, so, generally speaking, yeah, anything that that I build in my own time on my own devices um, is, yeah, it is not subject to any kind of clause okay. like that. So, I think the, the the laws in California, at the very least, where I live, uh, around that, are very, very uh, good compared to compared to everywhere else. It, it, you know, maybe that as an employer, you could put a clause like that in, a, in an employment contract, but it would be ruled invalid in an instant. Okay. I think so long as so long as I'm not going to my day job and hacking away on right. brain blocks there, which which I'm not, right. uh, then then there aren't really any problems. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, do you think that like so PayPal is it's not a uh, it's there are banking parts of PayPal, but um, for the most part, it's not like a bank, but it is part of the traditional banking system. Um, do you see PayPal and cryptocurrency as like an us versus them, or like how does how does that work? Um, I guess with, without speaking out of turn, I don't I don't necessarily see it as an us versus them. Um, I, I guess it's just that cryptocurrencies are very very new. Nobody really knows what what they're going to be yet. Um, I mean, for example, for a while, PayPal's child company Braintree was uh, supporting Bitcoin payments. Um, but I think the level of interest at the time wasn't wasn't high enough to make that mm. a kind of worthwhile endeavor. So I think it's just it's just very early days, mm-hmm. um, and I don't want to speculate too much. But you know, yeah. uh, I, give it a few hours. I'd say. Okay, and I guess I, I kind of a follow up on that. Since you work for PayPal and you create things that you think are amazing for PayPal, um, because that's what we do, and you want people to use the things you create for PayPal. Um, kind of gives you, I think, a better perspective on like the plight of cryptocurrency, you know, versus the systems that have a big support system. So how do you, how do we work through that, do you think? So, well, so I guess one of the inherent value propositions of cryptocurrencies is that they are decentralized and to a certain extent can't be controlled. I mean, maybe a government tomorrow could say, okay, we're outlawing cryptocurrencies, we're banning them entirely. 
but that wouldn't really, I, I don't feel like that would really stop them from running. They, they've reached enough of a decentralized state that, that they're kind of, you know, almost unst- unstoppable at this point. Mm. So, so there is that, and there are the, the you know, the crypto enthusiasts that, that, that see that as a real, really valuable thing. And that's, that's one of the things I think that's grown the adoption of cryptocurrency so much. People use them because they feel like there is no central control. There's no one who can dictate what the value of it is the coins are going to be there's no one who can reverse a transaction or or do anything to to kind of make it harder for for someone to to pay or you know anything along those lines but on the flip side of the coin making oh the flip side of the coin there's a good pun for you (laughs) on the flip side of the coin um i think having that level of decentralization has the potential effect of making it more more difficult to kind of get adoption outside this world of uh of just the, the enthusiasts it's great as a crypto enthusiast i can send money to someone else without no anyone knowing who i am or you know or what my name is or what my date of birth is or anything like that that's fantastic but then once you start integrating into you know um bigger e-commerce platforms and and bigger companies want to start taking payments suddenly a lot of that becomes less relevant i guess or or kind of even impossible like uh, companies need to know who they're dealing with, who they're receiving money from, who they're shipping goods to. So, so what that centralization, I think, is is absolutely necessary. But it 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 becomes, I guess, more of a friction point for cryptocurrencies to kind of grow. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so in that sense, I don't I don't see kind of your traditional, you know, payments and e-commerce companies like PayPal or Stripe or whatever else and your decentralized currencies, I don't see them being in too much conflict mm. because that there has to be a certain compromise. There has to be a certain level of centralization that, that's, that's built into systems that, you know, makes them actually usable in the real world. Mm. Having that, having that original level of de- decentralization is, is absolutely necessary mm-hmm. and really useful and it, and it still works for everyone but mm-hmm. I think probably things will end up pushing in the other direction for, for it to start being mm-hmm. used in bigger systems. Yeah, that's interesting. That actually reminds me a little bit of uh, like green energy and uh, so like you can, at, at this point, most people, at least in the United States, uh, even though they have like a traditional energy company that maybe uh, uses types of energy that we aren't that we don't like, you're able to like through another company get like wind energy to like su- supply to your home. Um, and uh, I don't know that I, I see some correlations there. Uh, sure. Once the currency is made, then a, a centralized entity like, you know, Rayblox, for example, uh, can then come in and provide a service. And I guess there's there's kind of a certain element of kind of you know your your free market uh, models working there, you know, because because the core uh, you know platforms and the core network for things like Nano are all open source. Everyone has equal access to those things. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of potential for for competition, and you know, if if someone wants to come along and better, build a better service than Brainblocks that is even cheaper uh, or even faster, <laughs> then they have every right to do so. And and you know, there's nothing anyone can do to stop them. Yeah. Which I think, which I think is less true in the traditional kind of payments and finance world. You know, there are some very big players who control all the networks, and you know, what they say often is what goes. Mm-hmm. So there's a, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of room for innovation there as a result mm-hmm. of that decentralization. Mm-hmm. Out of all the things about Nano, what's the one thing that gets you the most fired up? Um, so, my first thought would be to say to say the speed. Um, I think the the fact that it's come along and managed to be a currency that even with a lot of volume manages to still be fast that that's a great selling factor. Um, but I, I think the thing that tops that is is the fact that they managed to do it without any transaction fees. Mm. I mean. You know, any any payments company in the world can come along and say, we made this really fast. Uh, we bought a million servers. Everything is going to be super smooth. But none of them will tell you that they're going to give you that service for free. Right. And I think that's that's where Nano really has the potential to become the payment method of the future. You know, if you're running a business, it's it, it's fine to pay, you know, a few percentage points every for every transaction or whatever. But the more and more services you use, the more and more those that, those amounts add up, and the more and more your bottom line is kind of you know all just going towards processors mm-hmm. and and card vendors and so mm-hmm. on. So I think I think in terms of in terms of adoption as a real world payment method, I, I think that's the biggest thing it has going mm-hmm. for it. 
Um, aside from that, it's it's great that it's open source. It's great that the the, the kind of core development team is so is so open and, and helpful. I you know I personally uh, Ty and I have had a really really good experience working mm-hmm. with those guys and and getting our issues resolved. They they really know what they're doing and they've been been super open about everything and all of their future plans. So that's been fantastic. Uh, but yeah, just gen- generally speaking, the fact that they managed to keep it free mm-hmm. is just amazing. Yeah, uh, it would be interesting for someone to put together. Uh, or you know, I don't know if these numbers are out there. If they'd have to guess, but to put together a list of like uh, what Amazon pays in credit card fees on like a an annual basis, and what Walmart pays in credit card fees, and all these big box stores or these big companies, um, Apple. Uh, yeah, that would just be an interesting thing to to see and be like, yeah, you guys could save all this money. I think I think it would, yeah, and I think. I mean, this is this is kind of an area that not a lot of people have innovated in because it's just seen as the norm. Mm. Uh, if I'm going to accept payments from you, I have to give a cut to to the big man over here. You know, mm-hmm. that's just the way it's been, and no one's really questioned that. I think probably until now. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. um, this is probably a good time to make a plug for decentralization and and uh, hosting a node. I, that the only way this is possible is by people hosting nodes. Uh, so you guys should do that. And there's links. I'm going to put links in my description for how to do that so you can go find out um do you agree with that i absolutely agree with that yes uh so one of the interesting things about nano is um there is no mining um so there is no there is no kind of inherent financial reward for for kind of running your own your own node and doing any kind of mining so i think it's going to be uh, it's going to be a, very, a bit of a different kind of environment mm-hmm. with more and more nodes being run by say services like brain blocks mm-hmm or enthusiasts or basically any any company that really wants to do any kind of big transactions in nano is going to have to kind of pull their weight and become a part of this network Mm -hmm. uh which to me which to me feels like the right the right way forwards Mm -hmm. i think with with traditional blockchain based currencies like bitcoin uh you're always hearing about how much power the miners have over the network Mm -hmm. how difficult it is to get updates and changes and you know features that are really really good for the community it's it's really difficult for them to get that, that, that out there because the miners want things one way and the community wants things another way. So that kind of that kind of problem, I think, isn't inherent to Nano, mm-hmm. at least not yet. Right. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to see. I don't think that problem ever will be, but I wonder what our version will be. Um, right, yeah, you've got to wonder. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's. Uh, I should also say, if you don't want to set up a node, you can use BrainBlocks or NanoCast as your representative to uh, help decentralize the network further. So there's more information about that down yonder also. Uh, so what do you think is next for brain blocks? Uh, so we're in kind of an interesting position right now because, um, so I mentioned that I started this thing as a side project. Um, I had my, uh, I guess I'm calling my co-founder, Ty, uh, started working on this thing about maybe three or four days after I released the initial version. Um, so he and I have just been plugging away in this for the last few months and building out uh, mobile SDKs and e-commerce platforms so we have you know a shopify integration a woocommerce integration and open card integration we're working on a point of sale system mm-hmm. we've really just been doing a kind of breadth first how can we get this thing in the hands of as many different merchants as possible and just make it as seamless as possible for them to start accepting that mm-hmm. um so that's that's worked pretty well up until now um we have yeah quite quite a few merchants that have integrated with this we're still seeing um a fair amount of daily traffic mm-hmm. and transactions coming through so definitely people have been interested in picking this thing up. Um, and I guess recently we started asking ourselves the question, you know, what do, what do we want this thing to be in a year or time? Do we want it to keep, do we want to keep it as a hobby project? Do we want to uh, make it into something real or, you know, do we actually want to go out and start seeking investment and, and building, building what we have and getting more engineers on board. And I think right now we're leading towards that, that latter side of the coin. You know, we, I think I think we ha- really have something good going, and I think Nano is definitely the, the the right avenue for it. And I'd love to see Brainbox become something something more than it is today. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the things I was mentioning earlier is just the kind of the friction points around accepting cryptocurrencies in general. You know, the whole um, installing a wallet and taking pictures of QR codes and having to convert money from from fiat. USD, whatever else, every time you want to make a transaction, mm-hmm. that's super, super painful. And, and you know, it's fine for enthusiasts; they're happy to deal with exchanges and mm-hmm. varying exchange rates and everything else. But for your every man that just wants to pay for a cup of coffee or to buy something on Amazon, that really isn't going to cut mm-hmm. it. So, so my vision for Brain Blocks is is really how can we how can we turn this thing into a payment method for humans? Mm-hmm. I think we've already got 
a big a big chunk of that you know with it being free and fast that's that those are really good building blocks but we really need to like think out to use the cliche think outside the box in terms of how we're we're kind of build, building this thing to be usable by anyone not just the people who read reddit and the people who mm-hmm. are, have an exchange account yeah so in terms of where the, where the product is that that's where i'd really like to go um and i know ty is very interested in in you know yeah trying to find some investment for this thing and, and really really building it up um so the interesting thing there is i think that would probably be where i'd have to take a step back so my current work arrangement doesn't let me work for multiple companies at once yeah. um so if this becomes more than a hobby project that would be kind of where i would be taking a step back and just letting it letting it go free mm-hmm. um but i read a blog, blog post about that a few weeks ago and i think that's i think that's probably a good thing um i'd, I'd rather see brainbox become something big and become something real than just to have it as my own personal pet project for the next few years and have it dwindle away or anything like that. Um, so that's kind of where I see the future going. Um, awesome. I have a couple of questions, but before I do that, uh, you mentioned a blog post. Uh, I'll put a link for that in the description. Everybody should go read it because it's, it's really good. So thanks for writing it. It's a cool kind of window into who you are and just your passion as, as this interview is as well. Um, so you said you were you were talking about transactions or people using brain blocks and I was I figure you probably have uh some sort of automated spreadsheet that kind of shows you the number of transactions that happen per day and how much they are and um has it been cool to kind of watch that go up? Um so we kind of have yeah, we have rudimentary analytics in place. We've been focusing more on just building out interesting features and e-commerce integrations and tracking everything too closely. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it has been really interesting. Yeah. Every time a new merchant integrates, we normally notice we have uh, some little alerts that pop up, mm-hmm. you know, we go and actually try the site out. Um, so I posted cool. a few examples in, in the blog. I mentioned of the things that I've been buying and, mm-hmm. and trying out. I got some, some hot sauce, which turns out was really, really hot. <laughs> if you're going to buy that hot sauce, then, you know, be warned. Um, so yeah, I've been, I've been trying to kind of go through and anyone who's, anyone who's using us, I really want to see what. What are they using us for? What is our market? Who who are the businesses that are that are integrating our, our button and our mobile SDKs? And it's been really it's been really interesting seeing seeing yeah a lot of I guess a lot of small merchants you know who are, are just trying to kind of you know make a make a bit of a living. Um, they're they're pulling in our stuff and they're getting they're getting payments now from customers and not having to to, to send a fee to anyone. Mm-hmm. So I I think. In, in the short term, it's these kinds of small businesses, you know, your your 10 to 20 item stores that are selling kind of, you know, little little items that they've made themselves or, you know, stuff like that. I think that's really been where our core market mm-hmm. has been. And it's been great seeing, seeing those things pop up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely easier for smaller companies to integrate brain blocks or it, I don't know. No, it doesn't really make more sense, but there's less, uh, maybe there's less red tape for a smaller company to integrate uh, nano than others. I, I guess, I guess, yeah. So if you're, if you're a company who's been, you know, you've been keeping an eye on cryptocurrencies and you've been kind of thinking, oh, well, it'd be nice to get into this, but it's maybe too complicated, complicated, or there's too much uncertainty around what the fees are going to be in six months time. Um, I mean, I know during, during the last big wave of, uh, you know, Bitcoin gaining a lot of value. Uh, I, I think a lot of companies were disincentivized by the fact that, you know the the exchange rates were changing. You know, but just in in between the buyer sending the money and the company receiving it, the exchange rate would change so dramatically that it almost wasn't worth getting into it in the first place. Mm-hmm. So I think we solve we solve a lot of those problems. Um, and and I think just just uh, you know our integration tries to be as easy as possible. We just want to have a copy and paste thing that you drop in your site and then you don't think about it anymore until you actually want to cash out. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's been a big factor in all of this. Um, you mentioned uh, POS system. What? How, I don't know what you want to share about that, or if you can share anything about it. But what? How do you envision that working? Um, yeah. So I guess POS is one of those problems that you know is really difficult to solve. I think many many big payments platforms have tried, and a lot of them have failed. Um, Actually, hold, you know, hold on one second. Is- uh, I just realized we should clarify for all these crypto people that we're not talking about point of stake. We're talking about, or proof of stake, we're talking about point of sale. So go ahead. Right, yeah. <laughs> so we're talking about people going into a brick and mortar store and picking up an, a physical item and, and paying for it, um, which is which is somewhere, yeah. I mean, there have been a lot of, you know, a lot of online payment systems that have tried to get into that market. 
and really had a difficult time. I think Apple Pay is, is doing pretty well. Mm. Um, pay, PayPal's tried. It, you know, we've released several devices. Square, every, everyone else is trying to get into this market. Mm. So we really see that as kind of more of a, a, a long-term play. I think once crypt, cryptos are going to be the currency of the internet, you know, in the short term, in the next couple of years. But but we're really thinking ahead of that. What's going to be happening in two or three years? You know, what's going to be happening when everyone has, hopefully, everyone has some nano on their phone that they want to spend? Uh, we want to be there ready for when, when that happens and make, make sure there's a really easy way for people to just take out their phones and accept something or, or even simpler than that and, and just be able to pay in an actual brick and mortar mm-hmm. store. So... Um, so right now we have a kind of proof of concept, and I, I think Ty is going to be releasing something soon in, in that area. We already have a, an, a beta for our uh, mobile app, um, which has a, a kind of point of sale style system. We're going to be building on that, and just yeah, releasing any new features that we have. Um, but we were just really, we really just want to be able to you know be there. We want to get get in as early as possible and make sure that if there are physical brick and mortar stores that want to start using Nano, they can do that from day mm-hmm. one. Cool. Um... I guess uh, another question I have about some of the things you were saying was you were talking about like for people who don't have access to an exchange or uh, people who, you know, aren't just like crypto nerds, like we want to be a system that they can use. So how does that work without an exchange? How do we get nano into people's hands? So I think having an exchange is fine. It's just when... As, as someone who wants to pay with Nano, I have to go, well, I mean, first I have to go and probably buy some Bitcoin or some Litecoin, and then I have to transfer that to a different exchange and use it to buy Nano. And then I have to take that and transfer it to my wallet, and then I use my wallet to pay with a QR code. And it's like, it's just so, by the time I've paid for something, I, you know, I have to go and get a cup of tea or something. I'm so tired out because I've done all of this, all of this stuff, and I've had to learn about, you know, three different systems. And I've had to create accounts on, on you know, two or three different websites and, and just in order to pay for something. And I, I don't think that's that's ever going to be good enough. You know, we have to get to a point where all of that is is automatic. If I want to pay for Nano, I have to just be able to really seamlessly link up maybe one of one of my credit cards or my debit cards. And and then, and then I'm that from from then on, I'm able to pay. So I think. I think in the in the Bitcoin and the Litecoin world, um, Coinbase is making some really good headway into that into that kind of area. Um, but I still think it's it's not nearly as simple as it could be. Um, they've they've done a good job in separating. Okay, here's our exchange. If you want to use it, if you want to see a lot of graphs with red lines and green lines, then you can go there. Otherwise, if you just want to you know casually use Bitcoin, hit this big buy button. We'll take your credit card. You don't have to think about what the current market rate or anything is. We'll just handle all of that for you. And I think that that secondary offer, offering is kind of it's it's less what the core community needs because everyone everyone you know on Reddit or Discord is very clued up about how the currencies work. But if it's ever going to expand outside of that area, we need to really make it that easy or even easier for people just to link their card, pay with Nano, and and they're done. They can use it even if they you know even if they don't understand how the technology mm-hmm. works. Cool. So you see, you think that. Uh, payment processing vehicles like BrainBlocks could play a part in that? Um, that's the direction I'd really love BrainBlocks to go in the long term, yeah. I think I think right now we're a very, we're a very community-oriented platform, which is, which is absolutely great because the amount of support that we've gotten from the core nano community and the core nano devs has just been, you know, exactly what we need mm-hmm. at this stage in our lives. But we, but we want to, you know, we want to set our sights higher than that. We want to make sure, you know, we should be we should be something that can be used by you know the layman by anyone who wants to start using crypto mm-hmm. payments, and I think I think the core technology of Nano really enables us to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, if if you told me about uh, Bitcoin and I hadn't heard about it, and you told me, well, you know, you might have to pay a twenty dollar fee if the if the network rate is too high, and you might have to wait three or four hours for the money to go through, and your coffee is going to be cold by the time you bought it, <laughs> I'd say okay. No, I'm just going to use my credit card. Right. So, you know, we have to we have to think how can we how can we make crypto payments, you know, as easy if not easier than than what's out there at the moment mm-hmm. because if if we don't then what what future does it have? Right. Uh, right. Um yeah, it, it's decentralized may mean a lot to us, but to most people they don't care. So that's not what we like that that's something we want everyone to understand, but that maybe isn't where we need to start. 
I, I think you're entirely right. Yeah, it, I, I think everyone can probably appreciate the value of, of decentralization and open source and everything once they start doing a little bit more research into how things work. But it's not what they want to hear when they first mm-hmm. yeah, start thinking about using it. Yeah. So that sounds like that's the best way for cryptocurrency or nano to gain adoption. Uh, is there more to it? Uh, how do you think we make nano gain adoption? So, um, adoption is a really is a really interesting thing, and I think it's it's been really interesting watching this whole wave of of you know Bitcoin and altcoins play out, and just just see what what is it that makes people actually want to use these things. And obviously, so far, a lot of that has been based on investment value. People people pick a coin because they think it's going to be worth ten times what it is today. Mm-hmm. Um, in, a, in a couple of weeks, and they're going to be able to cash out and make a lot of money. So I, I don't think any of that is relevant to how a coin is going to do in the long term, mm. it, as to how it's going to how it's going to actually become something real. Uh, I think I think for that, you know, you really just have to look at first of all, yeah, what does the technology offer? Um, what is the initial community after? Are they are they looking at this as a pump and dump scheme, or are they looking at it? as something that can grow and what are their reasons for wanting it to grow i mean you know you get the classic case of people who will go on reddit and post every article they find because they want to they want to just increase the amount of hype for a coin and they want to make people excited about it and it's really just so they can cash out and they can make a quick buck um i, I think part of part of getting adoption is, is to start thinking longer term than that mm. it's to start thinking how can we how can we make this technology how can we leverage leverage this technology in such a way that we're we're making it more va- you know valuable as a payment method to to people than, than traditional credit cards and traditional bank accounts and I think that's a really that's a really tough sell because a lot of these you know, a lot of these centralized systems are very you know they're already very easy mm. it's very easy to click on a PayPal button it's very easy to send money using Venmo it's very easy to bring out your Amex card and, and swipe it and pay so that that's definitely an uphill battle mm-hmm. um, part of it I think is a generational thing I think people are excited about it because it's it's new and it has it has a lot of new interesting things to it and it's kind of uh, you know, it's it's one of those things that it's, it's difficult to predict how how popular it's going to be because a lot of it is based on network effects and and you know my friend uses Bitcoin so I'm going to try it too even if it's harder to use. Right. So so definitely there's going to be an uphill battle in actually make, getting to that point where where it's even easier and even you know even better than than what there is today. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 it has to be it has to be more than just oh the government has no control over this because you know. To a certain extent, that sound, starts sounding a little bit like you're wearing a tinfoil hat. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there there are a lot of good reasons for for government control over currencies, right? There's not nearly the amount of of fraud or you know um, Ponzi schemes or mm-hmm. so on. That's that's almost a solved problem with real currencies, and and we're going through all of that again with cryptocurrencies and people setting up these schemes to get rich quick. Mm-hmm. And there's there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of sense around the cryptocurrency world that you know, even if it even if it is decentralized and even if the tech is good, it's just one big scam. People, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people view it in that way, Absolutely. and it has to it has to break free of that mold, and it has to really be you know, and, and a lot of that I think is just a matter of it's a matter of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, these 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 currencies are very very new, and I think it just they need they need a few years to settle mm-hmm. in the public consciousness and become you know something that are. That, that are taken seriously yeah. rather than just, you know, uh, yeah, a very quick, mm-hmm. get rich, quick scheme. Yeah. Uh, this is in the long game. This is just a growing pain. Um, and ultimately that's how we need to be looking at cryptos anyway. Even if we first got into it because we wanted to get rich quick, we all know how that turned out. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> um, what, what's the best thing that the nano community can do for nano? Um, honestly, spend it. Uh, don't just hoard it. Use it for what it was intended for. Even if you have some way of automatically topping up your account or reinvesting, like I, I get that feeling. You know, I've I've bought a few cryptocurrencies over the last few years, and and I felt like, oh, why should I spend this? Because tomorrow it may be worth ten times what it is today. But I think getting out of, getting out of that mentality and actually using the coin to buy things, setting up your own stores to accept it. Um, just really, really embrace it as as an actual currency. That's how it's going to be taken seriously. That's how it's going to last longer than a couple of years. Mm-hmm. 
Cool. Uh, a couple more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the security of BrainBlocks? Can we trust it? Uh, I would hope so. Um, so as with as with any system that's built around the core protocol, um, you know, I'm not going to uh, beat around the bush. It is a centralized system. Your money goes to the BrainBlocks system, and then it goes out of the BrainBlock system. So, so for a brief period of time, while it's flowing through our system, we have control over those over those funds. So, obviously, our security around that has has to be top notch. Um, you know, my my experience from working at PayPal has given me a, a keen eye for this kind of stuff, and I've been very careful to make sure that that nothing you know nothing there is going to be leaked out and so on we're in very close uh, contact with the the nano core team mm -hmm. most of it is just interacting with their core platform um just sending requests to and from the node to send and receive funds and they haven't come back to us with any with any problems so far so security wise we're, we're fine and i think uh i guess one of the big um one of the big problems there have been in the past is been with exchanges uh, in, in the cryptocurrency world. So you'll get exchanges like like BitGrail that end up hoarding huge amounts of coins. And then the moment someone finds a single vulnerability, you know, potentially it's all gone, mm -hmm. right? Um, you can hack them, you do some one-time hack and, and get get all of the funds. I think with something like BrainBlocks, it's, it's a bit more of a nuanced problem because with the way BrainBlocks is right now, we're not currently holding on to anyone's funds. We receive it, and the moment we receive it, we send it on. So at any given time, we're not really holding very much currency, which makes mm. security obviously just as much of a just as much of a problem, but with much less of a fallout if something should go wrong. Mm -hmm. We'd we'd notice straight away if there was any kind of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, so far, there haven't been any any attacks, uh, nothing that's got through, and we've been keeping a very close eye on on all of our transaction logs. So any kind of DOS attacks or anything, we I think we'd notice immediately. Sweet. Uh, um, if you had to give an elevator pitch for brain blocks, what would you say? Why should people use it? Uh, good question. So I think um, I would use it uh, today just because you're getting in on the ground floor. Um, it's something that has a lot of potential. Um, there is virtually no cost to adding it, so it's an easy win. Um, I think the rewards from from using it down the line, uh, you know, once once it starts getting more adoption, once more people start using it to pay, the the rewards are going to be huge, and the fees are always going to be zero. That's that's one thing that we've committed to as a company. We don't we don't want to build something that that reduces the value proposition of Nano by by adding on a percentage transaction fee. I think that's against the spirit of, of the coin, and it loses us a lot. So so yeah, just you know you. you you're you're becoming an early adopter by accepting nano but uh you have nothing to lose mm -hmm. uh, i think cool um with what's coming in the nano pipeline what's the thing you're most excited about that's coming um so i'm really excited about some of the new stuff they're doing with the the new node the whole universal blocks thing is very exciting mm -hmm. um Actually, I mean, so one of the things I'm, I'm mainly excited about with Nano is, is how much they're committing to not change things. Mm. So they're not, they don't want to turn the currency into, you know, a smart contract accepting bloated thing that, that isn't going to scale. Mm. They, they really want to keep this thing a lightweight node that does one thing and does it really well, and that's sending and receiving payments. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, to kind of inverse the answer to the question, the less the less they do in terms of adding new elaborate features and keeping it simple and fast and pure, the, the, the better I think it's going to be. Sweet. Uh, yeah. So the last word goes to you. What are some words of inspiration for the nano community at large? Um, so I'd really like to encourage people just to go out and build, build their own things. If, if you're a hobbyist programmer or it's your day job, give give the node a try try sending some rpc commands give brain blocks a try you know throw it into a website and see what interesting things you can do with it build the plugin release it on github just go, go nuts because it's so it's so easy to get into building things around this that it's you know it's a lot of fun and you get a lot of reward from the community when you actually do release something uh so that's been great awesome thanks for that all right everybody Give a big thanks to Daniel for being on, and thank you for tuning in. Make sure you leave comments about who you want to see on NanoCast, what you want to see on NanoCast. Tell us if you like it, if we should do another season. And uh, this is the last episode, so thanks for sticking with us, or with me, all the way through. And uh, yeah, I hope to hear from you guys soon. All right, 
Uh, five episodes in. Still don't have an outro, so... I love Nano. I love Nano too.